Hey, Wealth Formula Nation, you know I like making money and I know you do too, but what if you could make money and promote clean energy at the same time? The solar energy market grew by 95% in 2016 alone and it continues to flourish. Something to think about as an investor. Introducing Wonder Capital, the award-winning online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar energy projects across the U.S. Wonder's online investment platform allows you to earn up to 8.5% annually while diversifying your portfolio and helping to keep our air and water clean. Your investment in Wonder's fully managed solar investment funds goes directly to helping U.S. small and medium-sized businesses install solar panels. Best of all, Wonder Capital doesn't take any fees for investing your money. Create an account for free at wondercapital.com forward slash wealth. That's wonder with a U capital.com forward slash wealth. You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. I'd like to start today as I always do directing you to back to wealthformula.com where you can get all sorts of stuff. You can download a special report on how to save thousands of dollars in taxes. You can get part of our newsletter. You can sign up for that. You can ask me questions on there. And also you can order a free copy of George Newberry's book, Burn Zones. And that's the book that every real estate investor must read before you go crazy and take down a couple hundred units at a time. So go to wealthformula.com, take care of that. Speaking of George, of course, George is one of the founders of American Home Preservation, which is one of our sponsors. American Home Preservation buys mortgages at pennies on the dollar from banks, and then they take these mortgages and instead of kicking people out of their homes, what they do is they renegotiate a lease, maybe a lease to own, and in the process, make a huge profit. So, you know, keeping people in their homes, doing a good deed, making a profit. And guess what? You as the investor benefit a great deal. You make 12% annualized return. Tough to do that anywhere. The money is very liquid and you can check it all out at ahpfunding.com. That it is ahpfunding.com. Now, let's focus a little bit on the message for the show today. Now, everyone defines wealth a little differently. Try it. Go ask a bunch of people, what do you think is wealth? Right? I mean, I think it's a very, very important question to answer because in the process, you figure out what's important to people. So my own definition of wealth is in the form of an equation. For me, wealth equals time. So time in particular is my currency of choice, more so than dollars or euros or any other kind of gold or precious, anything. Time, time is my currency of choice because it gives me the freedom to do whatever I like in my life. So the last couple of days, I have took my three little girls who are almost eight, four and almost two. So they're little girls and I took them sledding in the afternoon while most of my friends were slugging it out at work. So, you know, we actually had a really lousy winter in Chicago because it was cold but it wasn't very snowy. And so everything just looked dead all the time. And we didn't get a chance to go sledding, which is really what my girls like to do in the winter. So it snowed a little bit in March as it does here frequently. And finally, we decided, hey, we're going sledding, right? So I canceled a bunch of appointments and decided on sledding instead. So you get to do that when you have freedom to do things like that, right? And when you have time, and we have the ability to create time, that is wealth. So don't get me wrong, okay? As a general rule, I'm not one of those leisure guys, right? One of those guys who's talking about, oh, I really want to retire, and I just, you know, I hate my job and all that. That's just not the case. I actually really like what I'm doing these days. And, you know, the reality is, as much as I do like leisure, I get bored very easily. How about you? I mean, can you take literally a month off at a time and not get a little bit bored? Don't you get a little antsy, have a little desire to be industrious a little bit? Well, maybe not. If not, that's okay too, but that's me. And so the irony of that too, I should say, is that everybody who I've ever met who has enough money to retire and who could retire anytime won't retire, right? And that's because they love what they do. Maybe there's some deeper meaning to that. I suspect there is, but anyway, that's a side. Now, 
Listen, here's the deal is I have got four different businesses and I'm starting more as we speak. But, you know, that's what's fun for me. That's not work. I like starting businesses. Sometimes I get sick of the ones I have in the past. That's another issue entirely. But I like starting businesses. And for me, you know, that is fun. Giving myself time to do that is what I consider wealth. And it just so happens that occasionally one of those businesses does better and it gives me more money. And that in turn will even create more time or wealth for me. My wife is now a clothing designer. You can see her stuff, by the way, at oliviajoffrey.com. And that's sort of a startup. She actually started out as an urban planner. And, you know, she went to Stanford and London School of Economics. It's real fancy academic type, you know. But what she realized after a few years of doing that kind of thing is that she really liked designing clothes. And she's really good at it. And it was really more fun for her. So that's what she's doing. And she loves it. So again, The fact that she can do that is wealth. Similarly, my art, right? You know, I don't draw or anything. I can't do any of that. I wish I could. But my art is creating businesses and finding unique investment opportunities. Now, I say art because there is a certain creativity that goes along with entrepreneurship. And it's that expression of art that I enjoy the most. So in sum, wealth is being able to do what you want with your time. To me, that's what wealth is. What do you wish that you could do more of in your life? I mean, what's stopping you? More than likely, the answer to that question is time. If that's the case, then time is your currency too, because having more time is what's keeping you from living the life that you want to. For some, their calling in life is actually slightly different. It might be, say, for example, charity work. Now, I believe it's very admirable to spend your life in service of those less fortunate than you. but I also believe that you can sometimes be more effective if you've got more money that you can dedicate and give to a cause rather than just trading in your own time to that cause. And sometimes you can actually be more effective. I guess the way I think about it sometimes is, you know, how do you want to help people? Do you want to, you know, again, it's sort of almost like, what do you do for work? Do you trade your time in for money? Well, you're only going to get so far because you only have so much time. But if you can actually shunt money in there with some kind of business or some way of creating more income that you can then shunt to your charity, you're probably in reality going to even do more for it. Now, today's guest, Bill Manacero, is a very unique guy and he's got a very admirable plan. You know, he calls himself old dog. He's not that old. I think he's, you know, early 60s, but. He just started. Listen, he just started real estate just, you know, three years ago or something like that. And he wants to build a real estate empire, but he's not doing it so that he can get rich, so he can play more golf or whatever. What he's doing it is he's doing it to feed the poor in Haiti. You know, the idea here again is whereas Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, Bill Manasero's thinking, I'm going to become the rich and give to the poor, which I think is actually a lot more admirable than what Robin Hood did. So I hope you enjoy the show. And when we come back, Bill Manasero. As a lot of investors know, multifamily real estate has been one of the best asset classes to be invested in most of the last decade. While the great deals have been harder to find lately, there are still opportunities in select markets where savvy investors can get lots of appreciation and strong cash flow if you have a great team. Dave Zook, founder and president of The Real Asset Investor, and his team have been very active in the multifamily space in Memphis, Tennessee. On the heels of the Great Recession of 2009, Dave and his team quietly started acquiring multifamily assets, and in the last few years, he has syndicated over 2,000 apartment units, creating strong cash flow streams and big appreciation for lots of their investors. It's not too late to get involved. If you're an accredited investor and you would like to learn more about investing in great multifamily apartments with a world-class team, email Dave and his team at info at therealassetinvestor.com. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today, my guest is Mr. Bill Manasera, also known to adoring followers as Old Dog. And <laughs> he's Old Dog's REI Network. He is a podcaster. 
His website is olddogsnetwork.com, correct, Bill? Uh, that's, right. that's correct. That's right. So welcome to the show. It's good to have a fellow podcaster. on. Well, it's great to be here, Buck. Thanks. You were a great guest on our show and got some great things going on there. So we love working with you. Thank you. So I wanted to sort of, you know, just have a conversation and kind of get people to know you and who you are and your background, sort of an interesting story. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, where you got your start and how you ended up where you are? Because after all, you do say you're an old dog, so you've had some time in this world already. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got that. <laughs> Certainly in that old dog status. So we put anybody 50 plus. That's uh, give or take. I'm about 10 years over the minimum requirement to be an old dog. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Well, so tell me your story. Where'd you get your start and how'd you end up where you are? Well, sort of in a nutshell, started really early on in the uh, banking world. 21 years of age, I was managing a branch in Beverly Hills. I had a very successful growth spurt while we were in that place. I moved into the entrepreneurial world, started my own marketing consulting business, moving into establishing my own PR advertising agency. It moved into the dot com world, was actually a director of a software affiliate organization in Southern California. We help fund a lot of new technology companies and we're just at the beginning of the, the internet boom, you know, and got very involved in that. Eventually moved over to one of the internet companies that I saw a lot of promise in that Meg Whitman and a few others had put together and, you know, was just sort of riding the tales of this incredible growth spurt as well going on in uh, the technology sector. And then the bubble burst, you know, after many years on the corporate side, many years on the entrepreneurial side, it's a very significant change in my life. We formed a nonprofit organization called Child Hope International and took my whole family. We picked up, moved to Haiti, lived there for about 12 years. And while we were in Haiti, you know, we were sort of getting into our retirement years and and it's a tough place to live regardless of what age you're at. But we were realizing that it was, you know, it's time for us to go back for about 12 years there and came back and been an investor for many years in the market primarily, but uh, got into real estate investing while I was in Haiti, not investing in Haiti, but investing in properties throughout the U.S., and, you know, we came back to the U.S. after a long time in the mission field and started focusing on real estate investing. And because I was starting late in life, I had a lot of fellow old dogs, so to speak, that used to talk to me about, hey, what are you doing? You know, how's the investing going? And I'd start sharing it with them and some of the approaches that I was taking. Developed a pretty aggressive goal within six years to grow to a thousand units and focused primarily on multifamily. And in that process, uh, people are texting people and writing to people, decided, gee, maybe I should just develop a blog and just kind of share my story with folks as well as educational information. And that became the Old Dogs REI Network, which eventually evolved into a podcast as well. And basically, that's what I'm doing now. My goal is to reach 1,000 units by 2020. A big part of that is to support our efforts in Haiti, which we continue to do to this day. Sure, sure. So obviously, there was a shift. And and you mentioned that you didn't really turn to real asset investing necessarily until uh, later in life. Was it the shock of the dot-com meltdown? Was it what exactly triggered that sort of pivot? Because a lot of people never get there and they end up dying broke. Yeah, well, it became skeptical about the market. And in that process, I started pulling out a little bit because there are too many signs there. There was definitely something on the horizon. Some say that that's just a very short period away from us now, but there was a large sum of money that came in that I needed to invest and was comfortable putting that into the market. And that's where I immediately, I was in Haiti and I started doing research and looking at where's the best place to put that so that the tax consequences aren't too severe. And that's where I, real estate, it made total sense for me. And so I, after researching, I hopped on a plane for a week, ended up buying properties in Atlanta and Memphis and flew back to Haiti. And that's really where it started for me as I was looking for a solid place to invest. That was in 20. 2014. Okay. So that was after post 2008 too. Did you get hit by 2008 as well? Were you pretty much shielded by the land or the water between here and Haiti? Yeah. You know, believe it or not, 
there was nothing in Haiti that directly reflected anything other than our nonprofit where our, the giving went down significantly. Sure. But other than that, I didn't see it. I think that where I had invested in the market, I felt very little problems. And so I was pretty well vested, I think, on at least the market side of things. So it didn't really hit bad, but I've always been a real conservative investor and I still take that same approach when it goes into real estate. So you got back in 2014 you're looking around, you're buying some buildings. Obviously, 2014, there was probably even a little bit less cap rate compression than there is now. So it was still a little bit better environment. Now, if my math suits me correctly, you're in your late 50s. When you're there, what made you decide to become sort of more of an active investor as opposed to you know, more of a passive investor and say, go into their invest passively in syndications or invest in turnkey properties, et cetera. What made you sort of pivot towards more of the active approach to real estate? Well, I think because I was retiring a little bit earlier than I had anticipated, part of it was just, I didn't just want to sit around and collect seashells. You know, I, I love the acquisition and watching it grow picking the diamonds in the rough. I mean, all of the aspects of real estate investing just really appealed to me. And so I think the best is the fact that I had the flexibility. I could give it as much time as I want or as little time as I wanted. And that's what kept me going, especially the research, the educational part of it, learning, talking to others that are involved in various aspects of real estate investing. For me, it was just a shift. I'd been in, the, in Haiti, you know, dealing with crisis after crisis. You know, we were there during the earthquake, during hurricanes. My family just barely escaped being kidnapped. You know, malaria, dengue, fever, all these things. And then to come back to what I would consider normalcy and being able to sort of focus my attention in an area that I really love. And that's always been business. Right. So you kind of run it as a business. You're not looking at it as just sort of a passive investment and that sort of thing. So you said you had a goal of a thousand units or something like that, right? Right. thousand yeah. units by yeah. 2020. By yeah. 2020. And that was as of 2014? We're, Starting in 2014. Yeah. So where are you now? Yeah. Well, I'm basically into 2017. Currently, I'm looking for properties 150 plus. My system has been to double the number of units I have each year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first year I only had started with a couple of single families in a sure. duplex. And so I'm just following that sequence, just doubling, doubling uh, next year. It'll be, you know, in the 200s, 250s. After that, 500 or, so, you know, seven. Sure, right sure. Yeah. So it, just following that course. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're having fun with that. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you in particular was, the idea that for you, this isn't really about getting rich. I mean, this is about having some fun, learning, doing some business like you like, but you're giving a lot of this money back. Well, it's been part of my life and I really believe in what we're doing in Haiti. I've seen lives transformed. We're setting up businesses for kids that were formerly street kids and teaching them the fundamentals of business and uh, setting them up as a maybe a bakery or a silk screening business or a sewing business or whatever it may be. And to me, that's so much more fulfilling than putting another jag or another Ferrari in the garage. You know, I think the focus for me is just uh, seeing that a different type of investment, you know, you're investing in lives and the great things that emerge out of that to me have just been so fulfilling. I mean, there's only, only so much we need and I'm a pretty simple guy. I just love to be comfortable. I've got a big family. I got seven kids and four grandkids and I live in Southern California. So, you know, cost of living high here. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, Where do you but live? I mean, in Mission Viejo, California, okay. Orange County. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't need that much. So and I'd rather put it into invest in, in other lives that really can benefit. So, so that's really the focus is I think I will eventually move into that more passive investment role at a certain point. But right now, I'm kind of just loving the action, so to speak. Yeah, and, uh, no, that's great. It's fun. So do you have like a certain set percentage that goes off to Haiti or to these other projects based on cash flow? Do you have some sort of, you know, or is it sort of right now, you're just trying to build this thing and then we'll figure that out later? Or? Yeah, well, I think when we finally reach our goal, you know, the ultimately 80% of our income will be going to Haiti. And so that's the ultimate where we'd like to be. We're, we're roughly targeting a net 
a hundred dollars a door, which is, you know, pretty conservative. We're making a lot more than that in some areas right now, but that's sort of our average that we're targeting. Right. Got it. Now, in terms of, you talked a little bit about what's fulfilling and stuff. You know, this show, Bill, is called Wealth Formula, right? So yep. I'd like to ask you, because I think as having the years and the old dogness that you do, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm, I'm kidding. That's the first time I've heard that term. I'm writing that down. The old dogness. <laughs> yeah. What in your view, it, what's wealth to Bill Manassaro? Well, to me, I really feel that, that wealth is what you put in, not what you get out. And I see it in just the transformation that happens when you do that. Some of the richest men in the world, Bill Gates, and have these tremendous foundations that are doing amazing things in the world. And you don't have to be that rich to do that. You know, you can do that on just setting a certain amount aside that you're committed to philanthropic purposes and doing good in the world and trying to change the world. And to me, that's true wealth is, is to see a life transformed in real close to it. I know these kids in Haiti personally, and I've walked these kids since they were little kids up through adulthood. And now they're making it happen in their businesses. We have a little incubator project. You know, we grow and plant these businesses all around Haiti. And it's exciting stuff. And I invite, you know, other business people to get involved and plug into something like that to be able to mentor a young person like that. That to me is wealth. Do That's you have a way for people to do that directly? Sure. I mean, people can get a hold of me and I'd be happy to take you over on a trip sometime and to see what we're doing over there. There are some that are more passive that are investing in the projects that we're doing. And we have great returns on the syndications and so forth that we're looking at. So there are a lot of different ways to get involved. And it just depends on the individual and what kind of time they have. Sure, sure. So in terms of, you know, going back to the apartment investing that you're doing. So where are you looking right now? Well, we are big believers in emerging markets, and you can have an overall real estate market in the U.S. that really is not reflected in some key emerging areas, which may be very, very localized. And so a lot of our effort is spent in the research process, you know, looking mm -hmm. at where jobs are going, where businesses are going. With this huge growth in jobs right now, it's, this is a great time to zero in on new emerging markets. And we're looking a lot of areas, you know, places in Tennessee, we're already in Tennessee, but we're looking, you know, more toward the Nashville area, North and South Carolina. There's some good things going on. Texas is still hot. There are some sub markets in Texas that we're looking at real closely. We're also in Indianapolis and very active in Indianapolis, so as well as Atlanta. So those are sort of key areas, but we're always trying to discover new areas because our focus, especially on the multifamily side, is you know we're looking at a one to five year hold, and we look for something we can come in pretty close to the bottom of that bell curve as it's going up, and then we'll let go of it, you know, before it reaches the top of that area, so somebody else can benefit from some more upgrowth there. And then, you know, hopefully, you know, it's a tops out. So we're moving on to new projects and new areas. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing the effects of cap rate compression where you're looking? That's why we're looking at different areas. It's so regionalized. It's funny, even an area like Atlanta. I mean, you can go to other areas within a 20 mile radius of there and you, want, you aren't going to have the same compression you're going to have in certain areas that are hot in Atlanta. So, yeah, we do. We have seen it and it moves us to look in new areas all the time. It just gets real competitive, even in those compressed areas, because you've got the institutional investors and others that you're competing with. So I'm really more into the sub markets if I can find them. Yeah. Do you have certain buy parameters that you use when you're writing these deals? It's sort of a general sense. It really does depend on the market and the return on. We're investing in, you know, C properties and B areas. Or we're value add focused investor and our areas that we're looking at, sometimes, you know, they may be four or five on cap rates, but then there's others that we're looking at are eight nine, 10, especially when you go into these borderline areas where it's a C property in a B area, you know, at least a six to 9% cash on cash return, 20% annualized return and for our equity partners. But 
you know, it a lot depends. We're looking for the value add deal. We're not going to do major construction. We're looking for a place where new management's in place. Uh, you know, ideally, it's a mom and pop owned property. If we can get in there and just up rents, if we can do some, you know, nice upgrading in the units as well as in common areas and maybe some landscaping and so forth to bring up the value of it. We introduce rubs programs all the time where we're, you know, we're getting the tenants to share in the utilities that were previously taken or covered by owners. It's a way to bring our expenses down to boost our revenue. And that's can happen within a two year, three year, five year period pretty easily. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I'm just curious in terms of how other folks are underwriting The one thing that I'm seeing a lot of, because as you can imagine, I see a lot of deals and it's some of, obviously underwriting deals, I'm not underwriting, my my analyst or my team is underwriting deals all the time and we're sending a lot of letters, et cetera. And I also get a lot of deals that people want me to invest in. The tricky thing that I'm seeing is that a lot of, you mentioned a 20% annualized over five years, which is sort of the standard syndicator goal for our investors. But when I see a lot of these underwritings, I'm seeing, as you sort of alluded to, buying at a cap rate of five or pretty low cap rate. And then a lot of the return is predicated on a what we'd call a regression cap rate years down the line that sort of hasn't, you know, that really ends up influencing heavily what the total return is. And I hate to get into the nuances. I'm just curious more than anything what your experience is with that and how you handle that. Because saying that you're buying a net operating income, which is generally what my primary approach is, is what is the income on this property today versus you know looking at it in terms of a five-year pro forma and regression cap rate. How do you navigate that? Well, I think we're buying both for a cash flow and for equity. And one of the reasons why we're investing in emerging markets, yeah, I think going into anything, I'm very conservative, as I mentioned, and I say out of a hundred deals, if I send, you know, two or three LOIs, it's pretty amazing, but we do a lot. I mean, we're underwriting every day and to find something that really meets our requirements that's under market and value already is part of that play. And it's hard. It's really right. hard. It has to be a pocket listing for some broker. It's got to be off market. Sometimes we go direct to seller. So that's the only way. I mean, you can buy things that are steady and are already doing well, and that's fine. I'm not going to ever invest in A properties right now. I sure. just honestly believe that's going to get hit really hard on any kind of downturn in the market. But B Bs are fine. You know, finding the right C in a B area is great. So that answers your question. But those are some of the things that we're doing to try to hedge against that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's just something I wrestle with a lot when I see deals. But I think that the challenge right now is, again, you know, you can look at the same deal and three or four people might look at that deal and underwrite it completely differently, you know, and they may not necessarily None of those people may have nefarious intentions, but those numbers come out very different. So I think the challenge is, you know, how are you getting down in the weeds and looking at those specific parameters that so heavily influence returns over the course of five years? But anyway, that's almost sort of an offline conversation. And hopefully my listeners aren't getting a little bored by me right now. But <laughs> I think, too, does a real quick response to that is, mm-hmm. you know, we have multiple filters. We have an initial screen that we do that has super conservative numbers in it. And from that, I look at 20 properties, you know, maybe one only merge that's got close to the numbers we're looking at. And then we have a second filter. We go and we start to look at everything that we can get our hold of in terms of the rolling 12, the rent rolls and so forth. But then there's a third process where we really go deep. And that's where we really try to find, and this is all before even done inspections or anything of that nature. Sure. And so I think, you know, we, that's kind of, we're looking for the cream to rise at the top and then we really dig in. And so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, sure, that's, sure. Yeah. No, when you're getting those returns and that sort, what is there a standard Standard on your deals is standard in terms of the carve out from the sponsor and, you know, what the investor gets and that sort of thing. How do you guys set that up typically? Again, I'm real cautious, you know, as I gave you a sort of a range. Yeah, it's sort of a deal oh, specific. It, it, it goes from deal to deal and it just depends yeah. on where it's at, where the seller's at. Is a seller participating in any of the financing? There's a lot of issues. And so, you know, that's again, that's why I'm talking the six to nine percent cash on cash and the 20 percent annualized. So they're real conservative numbers. Sometimes it's a lot more. 
but generally not less. So that's the best you can do until you just have to look at each deal separately. And then when that particular deal is available, then we can get a little bit more specific. Got it. Got it. Now, tell me a little bit about what your focus is on your show, because I know you've had a lot of good success and you're targeting a certain avatar that's maybe sort of 50 plus interested in real estate investing in particular. Tell me what kinds of topics are you doing on there? Is it sort of real estate investing, landlord show? What's sort of the focus? Our focus really and our target's always been those that are 50 plus. So you've got a person that's either approaching retirement and they're kind of concerned. Maybe they don't think that they're going to have the cash flow to be able to do what they want to do in their retirement. And they've got those that are already there that are either bored and really are looking for something to do and to generate additional income. And then you've got that are just strictly passive investors that are always looking for a good place to put their investment funds. So our focus is generally educational. We're trying to you know, that's kind of two phase because I have a Friday podcast I do, which is much more personal. I go a lot into terms and, you know, what's a 1031 exchange, what's cap rate and what does it mean? And, but I also share on those Friday shows about my journey and where I'm at and the challenges I'm having in certain areas. And, you know, it's real personal on that end. Yeah. And then on Mondays is when we have, you know, great guests like yourself that come in and share their expertise. And they're from a large range. I think our focus is primarily multifamily, but we've had flippers, we've had you know land investors, we've had a variety, but our primary focus is really on that multifamily group that are interested in that niche. Yeah. Well, it's a really interesting show. Can you give us a little bit information of how we can reach out to you if we're interested? So again, the podcast is available at iTunes, presumably Stitcher, YouTube, the whole nine yards, right? And that's Old Dogs exactly. REI Network and yeah. the website. And dogs is spelled D-A-W-G-S. That's right. So folks know, yeah, we're, we're real hip, you know. There you and go. Sure, so sure. Old Dogs <laughs> REI, REI Network.com. And for those that are investors that are just in the investment side, I have a different website called uh, Manicero Properties. And my name is spelled M-A-N-A-S-S-E-R-O properties.com. And also on that site, I do have an article that those that are interested in our focus on emerging markets and our approach to emerging markets, why we've chosen that. And that would be manaceroproperties.com forward slash buck. And they can get that article that recently written on, you know, 10 tips for successful real estate investment in emerging markets. I love the fact that you're so hip to the technology, Bill. I mean, you know, having links with the name word buck on it and stuff like that. I'm so low tech here. And I mean, I'm. <laughs> well, hey, I'm, I'm, believe me, you know, while I was in Haiti, I mean, you were lucky if we had electricity, you know, uh -huh. um, you know, I have to have diesel fuel for my generator if I wanted to go on the Internet half the time. So it came back and I started getting into this and started, you know, get blogging and all of that stuff. I didn't even have a Facebook page until just like yeah. <laughs> about a year ago, you know, so I'm learning. I used to do web pages and HTML, you know, years sure, ago. Sure. Uh, so I still know, but I don't think they even use HTML anymore. So, you know, I love technology, but to say that a real student is a, definitely a misnomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it's been a pleasure and appreciate having you on the show today. Uh, Buck, it's been my pleasure completely. Thanks. And thanks for all the great things that you're doing too. You have a great site and your podcast just totally packed with great information. So I hope you enjoyed that interview with Bill Manicero. So what drives Bill clearly is charity, helping others. But you know what? The reality is we're not all like Bill. I certainly am a charitable guy, but you know what? I'm not going to move my family to Haiti and dedicate our lives to it. That's probably just a little bit much for me, but good for Bill. I mean, the important thing, though, I think, is that you have to be true to yourself. I know a lot of doctors out there who really enjoy what you do, but you wish you could do a little bit less of it or maybe be a little bit less dependent on your career in medicine because of the way things are going with reimbursement, with all the paperwork, you know, really all this bureaucracy that's making it really not so fun. I mean, the reality is, you know, everybody thinks the doctors are coming out, the, making a killing in this whole healthcare environment, and that is a bunch of BS. We're, my friends who are really dependent on this are getting cream. They're working longer hours, and they're making less, and you've got all these crazy 
concerns about getting sued all the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't it be great if you could just practice on your own terms, you know, as much or as little as you want? And have the freedom to do whatever else you want with your time. I mean, maybe you just work as much as you would, but at least having the peace of mind, knowing that you don't have to. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Listen, time is the currency that most of us strive for, but we don't even know it. How can you get more? Well, you can invest for cash flow and recurring revenue. I mean, that's the only way that I know how to do it. So I have passive investments and active investments both that produce cash flow and businesses that create income without my time. On this show, you've already been exposed to lots of ways to start and create more time for yourself through passive investing. And I mean, you can do that obviously through me. I've told you about Investor Club, but there's others that you can do that with. You can do it with some of these turnkey providers we're talking about, and we're going to have more of those on the show coming up. You can go out there and start an internet business. You can do all sorts of things. The opportunities are out there these days. Look at it, AHP, you know, American Home Preservation. They're giving you 12% annualized. These are great ways to make passive money. You have to take action. No, you can't just listen and not do anything about it. Listen, that's my message for this week. One other thing I want to say before I go is that I was at a mastermind this last weekend. It was a really great group. It's a group called Genius Network and some really, really brilliant people there. But one of the things that somebody said to me was, you know, why aren't you asking people to spread the news about what you're doing on the show? I said, well, it sounds pretty straightforward. I would assume they'd do it. But he said, no, you got to tell them. So that's what I'm going to tell you right now is if you listen to this show and you like what I'm saying and you like the community we're building, you know, you got to spread this news to others. So when I send out these newsletters, whatever, Make sure that you forward them to a couple of friends who you think could benefit from what we're doing, because I think there's a tremendous leverage. I mean, for me and for you, you know, we'll be able to bring on even bigger names on the show, which although we have some really big ones coming up, be able to, you know, benefit from the leverage that we obtain together. So please go and make sure the action step for you between now and next week is try to get at least one or two other people to listen to the show. So anyway, listen, this is Buck Joffrey. It's been a pleasure talking to you this week, and I will talk to you next week at the same time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.